Star Trek in across the universe on the Starship Enterprise under Captain Kirk. Star Trek in across the. Oh, mother factors, I do apologise. You caught me mid song. Hello, I'm Sam, and I'm here to talk to you today about one of the oldest, biggest, most expansive, and most beloved science fiction universes in the galaxy ever. No, not that one. Or that one. Or that one, whatever that is. No, I'm talking Star Trek. But how did Star Trek make diversity history? How likely are you to die if you're wearing a red uniform? My phaser is stuck on stun, how do I fix it? Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so strap yourself into a seat on the bridge and prepare the warp drive for a journey into the facty frontier. This is 101 Facts About Star Trek. Number one. What the hell is Star Trek, I hear you crying, despite the fact you clicked on a video all about it. Well, I shall tell you, my clueless friend. Star Trek is a 13-film, 7-TV series-long science fiction franchise that captured the hearts of millions across the galaxy when it first aired. Number 2 The first Star Trek TV series, often referred to as Star Trek The Original Series because it that's right, was the original series of Star Trek, beamed down into our telly boxes in 1966. Number 3 For you non-Trekkies out there, Star Trek follows the galactic adventures of James T. Kirk and the crew of the Starship Enterprise, operating under Starfleet, the peacekeeping service of the United Federation of Planets. Number 4 The original Star Trek TV series only ran from 1966 to 1969 before it was cancelled, so no more flailing about like this. However, it started gaining popularity again once it was repeated after the 1969 moon landing. Wow, people who flicked on afterwards must have thought space travel escalated very quickly indeed. Number 5 Following this resurgence, five other Star Trek series trotted along afterwards. The animated series The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager and Enterprise. Number 6 It wasn't just moving pictures on the telly box for Kirk & Co either. They also burst through cinema screens too. Not literally, the damage for that would be near irreparable. Eleven Star Trek films were made over the span of nearly half a century. Number 7 If you were to get hold of all 726 episodes, including the spin-offs and 12 so far Star Trek movies, and watch them all in order, you would have to put your life on hold for about two weeks straight. It would also be tremendously difficult to explain to your loved ones, doctor and work slash school too, so maybe don't do it. Number 8 When Desilu Productions started making Star Trek, Ona Lucille Ball was a little confused about what the show actually was. She thought the title Star Trek referred to celebrities visiting army troops in other countries, like stars actually trekking. See how she made that mistake? Oh dear, we weren't quite on the ball there, were we Lucille? Eh? Eh? Number 9 when Ball found out what they were actually making before shooting the pilot, she was a little bit surprised to say the least. But she actually ended up saving Star Trek from being killed before it even happened. Other Desilu Productions board members decided to scrap it, but she was convinced it would be a hit and made it stay. Number 10 The main crew from the original Star Trek series includes Captain Kirk, Spock, Montgomery Scotty Scott, R2-D2, Dr. Leonard Bones McCoy, Lieutenant Uhura, River Song, Hikaru Sulu, John Cena and Pavel Chekhov. Any mistakes there? No? Good. Number 11 Starfleet's finest and arguably most famous captain, James Kirk, was a quintessential leader who led his crew into the unknown and was played by the pine-scented Chris Pine and the delectable William Shatner, or as I call him, Willie Shat. Number 12 Willie Shat never actually watched the TV show or any of the movies that he was in, as he hated watching himself on screen. That's a shame he'd have missed out on this moment. Four. Number 13. Whenever Kirk had to appear topless, a barber would have to come in and shave Shatner's chest hair. This is because the creator of the show thought that in the future nobody would have chest hair, appearing all sleek and smooth like a dolphin. Okay, maybe I added that last bit in. Number 14 
Mr. Spock is a human Vulcan hybrid, and Captain Kirk's loyal sidekick, I mean, uh, second in command on the Starship Enterprise, and played by Leonard Nimoy and Zachary Quinto, respectively. Number 15. His skin colour was originally supposed to be red, like a British person after five minutes in the sunlight. However, the idea was abandoned when the creators realised that on black and white TV, Spock's skin would look black. Uh, nothing wrong with that, of course, but it wasn't the effect that they wanted. Number 16. Leonard Nimoy is the only actor to appear in all 80 episodes, along with the original pilot, of the original series. Number 17. In an interview, he said his father, who was a barber by trade, offered Spock cuts for men who wanted to replicate the voluptuous Vulcan, sexy Spock look, whose prime directive was to have it off. Number 18. Speaking of Vulcans, the famous Vulcan nerve pitch used for the quickest KO ever was actually improvised by Nimoy. In the episode Enemy Within, he was meant to smack Kirk upside the head. But Nimoy wasn't fond of the idea of Spock directly using violence, and so pitched the nerve idea instead. And then he did it. Number 19. If you fall down or have a scrap with an intergalactic space leopard, it happens, then you need to see the real McCoy. Leonard McCoy, that is, aka Bones, who's the chief medical officer on board the USS Enterprise, first portrayed by DeForest Kelly in the original Star Trek series. Number 20. Kelly was initially offered the role of Spock in 1964, but he said, nah mate, probably not like that though, and instead accepted the role of Bones from 1966 onwards. Number 21. The second officer, chief engineer, and the nickname that every person from Scotland has ever been called at some point in their lives, Scotty, was almost not featured in Star Trek at all. Number 22. <laughs> The creator of the series, Gene Roddenberry, said- Oh no wait, that should be a fact by itself, sorry. <clears throat> Gene Roddenberry was the man who birthed the Trek out of his own brain. Number 23. Anyway, Roddenberry sent James Doohan, who played Scotty in the original series, a letter that said, We don't think we need an engineer in the series. The cheek! Doohan's agent actually stepped in and convinced Roddenberry to leave him be. Number 24. Doohan apparently tried a variety of accents for the character, but landed on Scottish because he felt Scottish people make the best engineers. Lucky, really, considering the character's name and nickname, but anyway. Number 25. Lieutenant Uhura is the USS Enterprise Chief Communications Officer of Starfleet Command, played by both Michelle Nichols and Zoe Saldana. Number 26. Uhura and Kirk actually made a bit of TV history by giving each other the first interracial kiss ever seen on television way back in 1968. Sexy and inclusive, like an equality orgy. I love it. Number 27. The kiss was actually intended to be between Spock and Uhura, but William Shatner asked for the script to be rewritten so he could do it instead, the fantastic little pervert. Number 28. Gene Roddenberry felt it was very important to have a mixed-race cast, which was unseen on television when Star Trek debuted, because he wanted to represent what he thought the future might be like. Number 29. Hikaru Sulu is the USS Enterprise helmsman, portrayed by the fabulous George Takei in the original Star Trek series, and John Cho in the new films. Number 30. Pavel Chekhov is the navigator, security, and tactical officer. Christ, what a busy man of the USS Enterprise, played by Walter Koenig and Anton Yelchin, who tragically passed away in 2016. Number 31. Gene Roddenberry based the character of Chekhov on Monkey's lead singer and heartthrob Davy Jones. Not to be confused with the one with, you know, tentacles for a chin. Number 32. Alongside the familiar cast, there have been hundreds of celebrity cameos in the Star Trek TV series and films including X-Men director Brian Singer, Kirsten Dunst, and The Rock. Sadly though, J-Law has not yet popped aboard. I meant, by the way, I meant the, the Enterprise when I say she, you know, popped aboard, not <clears throat> anything. Is it hot in here, is it? Anyway. Number 33. The only person to make a cameo as themselves in Star Trek history is rock star scientist Stephen Hawking, who made an appearance in Star Trek The Next Generation. Number 34. 
Star Trek's theme song was written by film and TV composer Alexander Courage, which is a bloody brilliant name. Good work, Mr. Courage. He said it was inspired by a Richard Whitting song, Beyond the Blue Horizon, which is an absolute banging tune, fam. Number 35. Unknown to many, the theme song actually has lyrics written by Gene Roddenberry, which includes the lines, Beyond the rim of the starlight, my love is wandering in starflight. I'm not even going to try and sing that in time. Number 36. Okay, fine, I'll try. Beyond the rim of the starlight, my love is wandering in star... Flat. Nope, doesn't work. Doesn't work at all. Number 37. Roddenberry wrote these kind of pointless lyrics so he could receive 50% of the royalties for composing the song as the scribe of the lyrics. Meaning Mr. Courage's check was suddenly halved. The cheeky so-and-so had never actually intended for them to be heard on the show at all. Number 38. To boldly go where no man has gone before. The famous Star Trek line, not your weird mate's justification for wanting to break into the ladies' changing rooms, was thieved pretty much directly from a 1957 White House booklet on space exploration. Number 39. On the 7th of December 1979, the first Trekkie film, Star Trek The Motion Picture, landed into cinemas. Number 40. The first Star Trek movie almost included Captain Kirk fighting an alien that looked like Jesus Christ. Thankfully, Gene Roddenberry's script was panned. I wonder who would win, actually, though. Surely Christ would have the upper hand, but then Kirk's got the torso. Hmm. Number 41. The film marked the first time that the Klingon language was ever heard on screen, as in all previous appearances in the TV show, Klingons spoke in English. The meaning of life! Uh. Klingonese was first developed by James Doohan, who played Scotty. He devised the language's basic sound, first few words and phrases. Lost my wedge! It was then created into a full language by Mark Ockrand, a cunning linguist hired by Paramount Pictures. Number 44. When they first appeared, everybody hated the name Klingon for an alien race, but it was too late to change it as Gene Roddenberry had become sick. So the uh, Klingon name <laughs> clung on. Ooh, you suck! Who to you two? Number 45. The sequel to the movie, The Wrath of Kirk. Yes, thank you, Kirk. Descended into cinemas in June 1982. Number 46. The Genesis device demonstration video was the first entirely computer-generated movie sequence in cinema history. The studio that made that scene would, in fact, later be known as Pixar. Oh. Number 47. Many of the actors who played Car- <laughs> Yes, thank you, that guy's henchmen, were actually Chippendale dancers at the time of filming. Breaks in production must have been fun. Number 48. Kirk and Car- <laughs> That's not even the right movie! Never actually met face to face in the movie. This was due to a hectic filming schedule for Ricardo Montalban, who played C the bad guy, as he was shooting Fantasy Island at the time. Number 49. The third Star Trek film, The Search for Spock, debuted in cinemas in June 1984. Number 50. In the opening credits, there is a long pause between William Shatner and DeForest Kelly's names, as this was where Leonard Nimoy's name would usually be. But Spock had supposedly died in the film before, despite the, uh, title. Number 51! While he didn't have to do too much on screen, Leonard Nimoy took the opportunity to have a sit down in the director's chair for the first time ever. I mean, he directed the film as well, he didn't just, you know, sit there. Number 52. Star Trek IV The Voyage Home voyaged home into cinemas in November 1986. Number 53. In the film, Scotty helps Dr. Nichols invent transparent aluminium, or aluminum to you American folk, which in real life became possible in 2009, after it was developed by Justin Walk of Oxford University's Department of Physics. Wow, Walk must have been a Trekkie, I bet he overloaded his Walk drive. Am I, am I right? Boo to you two! Number 54. 
If you were confused by that word I just said, Star Trek fans are often called Trekkies or Trekkers, and they are the only fans listed by name in the Oxford English Dictionary. Mother Factors will be added next year, I'm told, by the man who I keep following to his office while I throw paper aeroplanes saying Mother Factor at him. He's a nice guy. He's only called the police twice. Number 55. This film features the only instance in the movies in which Captain Kirk says, Scotty, beat me up to his chief engineer Montgomery Scott when he's needed to be transported back to the Starship Enterprise. Number 56. The iconic catchphrase is often changed to beat me up, Scotty, which sounds way better, but is actually incorrect and never pushed out of anybody's lips in the whole series. Number 57. The fifth Star Trek film, The Final Frontier, uh, frontiered its way into cinema screens in July 1989. If that's not a verb, it is now. Number 58. This film had Willy Shat in the director's chair. All right, all right, I'm sorry, I'll stop calling you that now. That must have been one comfy chair. Everybody wanted to park themselves in it. Number 59. George Takei originally turned down his chance to reprise his role as Hikaru Sulu because of Shatner directing, but eventually Shatner talked him round and convinced him to feature. Number 60. The movie's climax could have been very different to the one we actually got. The big change was because the budget for the special effects had been cut drastically. Number 61. Roger Ebert loved the film and called it a... mess. Oh, okay, maybe not then. And apparently it almost genuinely nearly killed the whole franchise for good. Whoopsie daisy, Shatner. Whoopsie daisy. Number 62. Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, released in December of 1991, is the last film featuring the entire cast of the original series. Number 63. The concept and design used for the explosion of the Klingon moon Praxis, which I hear is lovely to visit in the summertime, would later be used in other movie films such as Stargate and Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope. Only films with star at the front, apparently. Nintendo 64. Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry sadly died shortly before the premiere of the film, just a few days after viewing it. I'm not saying there's any, you know, direct correlation there, it's just that's what happened. Number 65. Star Trek Generations regenerated itself in- oh no, that's something else. Uh, landed? In 1994. It was the seventh Star Trek feature film and the first to star the cast of the TV series The Generation Game. Oh no, wait, sorry, The, the Next Generation. And number 66. The film has a two caps, one ship kind of vibe, as Captain John Luke Picard, who looks an awful lot like Patrick Stewart, and his crew of the USS Enterprise D team up with predecessor Captain James T. Kirk. Number 67. William Shatner stated that his line to Captain John Luke Picard, who am I to argue with the captain of the Enterprise, was the hardest line he ever had to deliver. It can't have been that hard, I just did it. Oh, I see, because of the emotion. Right, I'm with you. Number 68. Generations was the first Star Trek movie to have a website created specifically to promote it. Pfft, and they say Star Trek is futuristic. It should have had that for movie one. Number 69. Star Trek First Contact, the eighth feature film in the Star Trek Enterprise. Ha, <laughs> see what I did there? First contacted cinemas in November 1996. Number 70. <laughs> First Contact is considered by many critics and fans as the best Star Trek film. It has a rating of a whopping 93% on Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. I mean, personally, my favourite one is The Empire Strikes Back, but, you know, hey, can't argue with that. Number 71. James Cromwell, who plays Zafrem Cochrane, was the first actor in Star Trek history to actually utter the phrase, a Star Trek. On screen, I mean, it probably happened loads of times after the camera was off. Number 72! 1998's Star Trek Insurrection is the ninth film set in the Star Trek universe. Number 73. It marked the first appearance of the newer, swankalicious white Starfleet dress uniforms. Sexy, though it can stain easily, so be careful out there. All of this could be yours for just $32. It's an absolute st Oh, sorry, this is all for the wrong job. Number 74. 
In the original series, gold uniforms were for command, red uniforms were for engineering and security, and blue uniforms were for science and medical. Number 75. Crew members with red uniforms were 73% more likely to die than any other colour, so maybe rouge ain't the colour for you if you want to, you know, continue living. Number 76. Insurrection was the first Star Trek movie where all space shots were fake. Nope, sorry, I should reword that. When they were computer generated. Number 77. Star Trek Nemesis, uh... Nemesis its way onto the cinema screens in December 2002? I'm Ron Burgundy? Number 78. It only grossed a pretty abysmal $67 million at the box office, making it the lowest grossing Star Trek film in the history of the franchise. Yeesh. Number 79. In an interview years after the release of the film, Tom Hardy, who plays villain Praetor Shinzon, Stated that the commercial failure of the film he thought would be his big break led to his relationship dissolving, his alcoholism, and his drug addiction. Oh, crikey, I hope things get better for that guy in the future. Number 80! Patrick Stewart was reportedly paid as much for this movie as he was for the entire run of Star Trek The Next Generation. Whew, not bad, Pat Stew, not bad. Number 81. The 2009 reboot of Star Trek with lens flare enthusiast J.J. Abrams at the helm, named Star Trek, was released. Number 82. It was nominated for four Academy Awards and ultimately won in the category for Best Makeup, making it the first Star Trek film to ever win an Academy Award. Yay, makeup! Number 83. Simon Pegg didn't actually audition for his role as Scotty. J.J. Abrams simply emailed him asking if he'd like the part. Pegg replied saying he would have done it for free. Simon Pegg, a geek? Who'd have thunked it? Number 84. Zachary Quinto, who played Spock, couldn't actually do the iconic Vulcan salute, which you would have thought of cost him the gig, but there we are. J.J. Abrams went all Coldplay and said he would fix him, and did so by gluing his fingers together in order for him to do it correctly. Must have been like a crab. Number 85. Quinto wasn't the only Star Trek character who found it difficult Vulcan saluting. William Shatner was also unable to do the salute. He required fishing line to tie his fingers together during filming to form the sign. It's not that difficult, I'm doing it now, see? Oh wait, you can't see me, this isn't one on one explains. Number 86. According to the DVD's audio commentary, J.J. Abrams had a meeting with George Lucas regarding how he could make the film better. Lucas replied by saying he should add lightsabers. Ha <laughs> ha ha, that cheeky scamp Lucas. Although that would be fun to see. Number 87. The sequel to the 2009 Star Trek reboot, Star Trek Into Darkness, not only had a title that didn't really make any sense, but it also landed in 2013. Number 88. Its gross earnings of over $467 million worldwide cements it as the highest grossing movie in the Star Trek franchise. Number 89. Sadly, Into Darkness was Leonard Nimoy's final acting role before his death in February 2015 at the age of 83. Number 90. Benedict Cumberbatch recorded the screen test for his role of John Harrison. <laughs> Alright Spock, spoilers! In his best friend's kitchen using his iPhone. Number 91. Being a Star Trek fan can help you with college fees. An organisation called Starfleet gives out $500 college scholarships to Trekkies. Hey, once you watch this video you might be able to get one. You're welcome. Number 92. The Lake Tahoe Community College offers an online course called Xenolinguistics Anthropology of Alien Languages where students can study Vulcan, Romulan, Klingon, and Tribble. <laughs> and they say media studies is useless. Number 93. There are over 50 different races in the Star Trek universe, including Klingon, Vulcan, Human, and Romulan. Number 94. The famous Vulcan salute was invented by Leonard Nimoy. Oh, I forgot to tell you how to do it. So it's a hand gesture that consists of a raised hand with the palm forward and the thumb extended, while the fingers are parted between the middle and ring fingers. There you go, now you're doing it. Number 95. 
Nimoy said that the salute was based on the priestly blessing performed by the Jewish Kohanim. Number 96. The accompanying spoken blessing with the Vulcan salute, Live Long and Prosper, is said to be inspired by the Jewish saying Shalom Alekem, meaning peace be upon you. Number 97. The US census receives thousands of forms where people claim to be part of a Star Trek race, for instance, Vulcan. It's just like how people put their religion as Jedi or Mother Factor. Or at least I'm hoping so, anyway. Number 98. Star Trek has been cited as being the inspiration for several different technological inventions, including the cell phone and tablet computers. So technically, we wouldn't have what we have now without Star Trek. So thanks, Star Trek. Number 99. Star Trek Beyond, the third in the reboot trilogy, coincides with the franchise's 50th anniversary. Oh, happy birthday, Star Trek. Number 100. In 1987, a British group called The Firm released a song called Star Trekkin', a novelty song that contains the lyrics that I sung right on top of this very video. It spent two weeks at the number one spot in the UK singles chart. Oh, good times. Actually, I wasn't alive. Number 101! In the hallways of the Enterprise, there are tubes marked GNDN. These initials stand for Goes Nowhere, Does Nothing, which is, weirdly, exactly what it says on Clive's jockstrap. Hmm. That was 101 Facts About Star Trek, and I don't know about you, but I had a lovely time, I really did. If you want more 101 Facts videos, like I really want to hear Captain Kirk say Khan again, I really do- actually f*** it, play it again. Khan! <laughs> Classic. Then click on subscribe right now and you'll get that. Not Khan, I mean, more 101 videos. Just as good, in a way.